great to be back. I'm, I was really grateful when Jesse asked me to moderate a session because this is like my background. Like I'm a, I'm a, I'm a piano player. It's basically what I am. And then someday, I, someday one day I became a CEO, um, a piano player, a musicologist, uh, 20th century music, mostly electronic music. And, and the next thing you know, um, I'm with a team building the National Music Center. So it's great to be back sort of in the field that really got me involved in this business in the first place, which is music. Um, before we get into this panel, which is a really exciting panel about preserving musical assets, near and dear to my heart and the, heart, uh, the hearts of everyone that works in this facility and our panelists and all of you, I wanted to, I was remiss this morning in thanking our team, um, which is something you always have to do because it always takes a team and the National Music Center is a team from staff to volunteers, and I mean at the board level right on through. So to Jesse Moffitt, our Director of Collections and Programs, or Delect Collections and Exhibitions, excuse me, um, Adam Fox, Daniel Goh, and others, and I know the, the planning committee here that was involved in creating the program. I know you had to do a few, like we all did through COVID, starts and stops, several starts and stops, and reorganizing this conference and changing the schedule. So thanks each, each to you for being flexible and coming to Canada, but I really wanted to recognize our team, our, our production team and Jesse and his team for uh, all the work that they did in organizing this and starting over more than once, so thank you. Um, so preserving musical assets, oh, what a topic. I love that topic. I love that topic. And there's a reason why I think Jesse asked me to do this because in my opening comments today, um, the National Music Center was born out of a need. It was born out of the inspiration of the work that many of you do in various parts of the world. And us seeing that work firsthand, myself included, over the last 25 years, and then coming back to Canada and having to answer difficult questions about Canada and our musical legacies and traditions. Things as simple as, artists, which is where, you know, I, that's sort of where I come in, and it's like, why do people not know that Oscar Peterson was Canadian? Hmm. Or Leonard Cohen, this is very interesting. Neil Young, Joni Mitchell. And those are the artists that we know of that are, you know, well-known superstars in, in popular culture. But these were, these were questions and frustrations that I certainly had, and, and I think it was very revealing to me for during the, the first session this morning on Hugh Lacane. Um, uh, about how there was a desperate need in Canada to preserve and protect, I think identify our musical assets, but find ways to protect them here in Canada and tell our story and be proud of it. Um, Hugh Lacane, I, I can add one story to that. I didn't want to do that in the Q&A, but for Lori Libin and others will remember that at the Smithsonian, in the year 2000, there was an exhibition on the 300th anniversary of the invention of the piano. You remember that show at the Smithsonian? Patrick Rucker, Cynthia Moore, um, Cynthia Adams, Cynthia Adams. Hoover, Cynthia Hoover, thank you. Um, Ted Good, the late Ted Good. I remember going to that, to that exhibition and there was some related programming to it on sort of the rest of the story and it was all about electronic music. And Bob Moog was a guest on that panel. I sat there and I listened to Bob Moe. He had a theremin on stage with him. Uh, Keith Emerson from Emerson Lake and Palmer was there, and they were talking about you know Moog modulars and and the influence of Wendy and Walter Carlos. And and I remember there was a question from the floor that, and and Bob Moog said, and I quote, and I remember these things. It was like there was this inventor in Toronto named Hugh Lacane that was doing stuff way before me, and he deserves a lot of credit for the work that I'm doing now and that I later did in my life as an inspiration. So I think listening to the stories about Hugh Lacane today about, you know, Canada, more people need to know about this and him and the work that he did. And that's why the National Music Center is here, <laughs> one reason. So I just wanted to share that story and I think as a lead into preserving musical assets because for Canada, um, we have to do a better job 
and I think we started with this facility in today's panel. So um, NMC is really committed to diversity and inclusion. I'm just gonna just get into it before I introduce today's roundtable. Um, and part of that has a lot to do with musical diversity as well as people and cultural diversity. I said in my opening comments today that all music is welcome at the National Music Center. All genres of music are welcome. They are on equal footing in our view, even though that still requires a lot of legitimization in terms of furthering this knowledge about particularly popular culture and popular music. Um, as seen in tangentially or beside Western European classical music and other forms of classical music around the world. And part of that story involves um, record labels here in Canada and EMI music in particular, which is gonna lead into this uh, topic. There was an individual, the late Dean Cameron was the CEO and worked at EMI Music Canada, started in the record room, one of these stories, started in the distribution room, worked his way up to CEO, and um, was very much responsible for being in the record business in Canada, Captain Canada. He championed a lot of Canadian artists, got them record deals, got them signed, when EMI first came to Canada a long time ago. I don't know the exact number, but we released the Beatles in Canada before we, you did in the United States, a short period of time. And Dean um, went on to work with many artists and being a voice for a Canadian artist from all walks of musical life, from artists like Susan Aglukark, who's an Inuit artist, Buffy St. Marie, some of you may know her, Tom Cochran, if you're from Canada, you'll definitely know who he is, and of course, Anne Murray, not Annie Murray, right here, who uh, Dean, I think, released 22 albums with Anne Murray. Um, he was a great champion and a dear friend of mine and a mentor of many people in this field. And he was very inspired by EMI Music Canada's archives, ending up somewhere, of course, it was a, lot, a large portion of his personal legacy as a professional. And we convinced him, we convinced him, and Universal Music, who acquired EMI in about 2012, we convinced Randy Lennox at the time, who was running Universal Music Canada, and Dean, that those archives needed to come to Calgary. Instead of staying in another part of Canada, shall we name nameless. <laughs> um, and luckily, the building of the National Music Center and the University of Calgary's willingness, uh, right at the senior executive level, the president, right to the vice, uh, right to the vice provo, saw this as an opportunity for Alberta and particularly for Calgary in light of the National Music Center being here. So I'm proud to say that we helped broker this relationship between a record label, a big, the biggest record label in the world, Universal Music, their former CEO, Randy Lennox, and the late Dean Cameron to bring those archives to the University of Calgary and where they live now, and which you're gonna hear more about. So this is an example of the work that the NMC has been involved in, in preserving musical assets, and it's just a real honor. I have really felt it was important for you to hear that context, um, and a real honor for NMC to help bring these archives here. And of course, the work that the University of Calgary's put into this is significant, and you're gonna hear all about it, because there's six of you sitting here. <laughs> it's huge. So uh, I wanna introduce Annie Murray, Rob Gilbert, Elizabeth Ann Johnson, David Jones, Andy Nichols, and Catherine Ruddick uh, to begin today's um, round table on preserving and sharing the EMI Music Canada Archive at the University of Calgary. Let's give them a hand. You're welcome. <clears throat> Hi everyone, thanks Andrew. Uh, my name is Annie Murray and I work in libraries and cultural resources at the University of Calgary. I'm one of the principal investigators of this multi-year, multi-million dollar project we're gonna tell you about. Today I'm here with members of our EMI Music Canada Archive Media Preservation Project team. We're going to give you an overview of what we've been doing to make available not yet, thousands of audiovisual recordings. This is the uh, official final month of our work on this project that began in 2016. So in these next, we're each gonna speak for five minutes and then we will welcome your questions and comments. Uh, in these next minutes, I'm gonna give an overview of this massive archive, how it came to be acquired by the University of Calgary and the generous funding we received from the Mellon Foundation to explore and test methods for mass migration, digitization, imaging, and preservation of archival media objects. 
spanning approximately 60 years of the music industry. My colleagues represent different aspects of the project and they each have their respective area of expertise. I want to thank the National Music Centre for their early critical support of the EMI Music Canada archive and some backstory is in order. Universal acquired EMI, including the, their forerunner Capital Records of Canada in 2012. At that time, Universal was thinking about a destination for EMI's remarkably and unusually intact archive. They dipped their toe into it and even made explorations with one very large Canadian research library and eventually learned that Andrew Mosker in Calgary was working towards the establishment of the National Music Centre. At that time, the proto-NMC didn't see themselves as a collector of archives and graciously introduced us to the people at Universal Music. So in 2014, the university sent a small contingent to Toronto to meet with Andrew Mosker and Universal Music staff to discuss the potential of these materials coming to Calgary. Um, by 2015, we had memorandas of understanding in place, donation agreements, many lawyers, and our very first archivist for the project, Rob Gilbert, was hired. We worked in secrecy for nearly a year, and at the University of Calgary, when we do special projects, they get code names. So this was um, the Milky Way project. Um, and when we hired Rob, we were actually not allowed to tell him what archive he would be working on, but I, I actually did tell him. I wanted him to be excited. So in March 2016, when the Juno, the Canadian Juno Awards were held in Calgary, uh, at long last, we announced this acquisition to the world. Within a few months of this announcement, the Mellon Foundation expressed interest in how we intended to preserve and provide access to such a large volume and range of media materials. So we were invited to submit a proposal for a starter grant to explore the feasibility of establishing this capacity at the University of Calgary. <clears throat> if any of you have ever worked on a Mellon funded project, you may know the intensity of working with a big funder like this and how exciting it is, but also how quickly you have to get yourself organized. So one starter grant turned into three grants total, um, allowing us to dedicate staff, acquire equipment, and secure the various components of the right infrastructure to address migration, digitization, and preservation of recordings. Uh, from the outset, we proposed a mixture of in-house migration and outsourcing of specific formats. Uh, Nathan Chandler was hired in 2016 to set up industry standard migration facilities and develop appropriate migration workflows. We also began to puzzle through the necessary steps to ensure the management of these huge media files. Through these grants, we went from absolutely no capacity in media migration to being able to work with more than 95 formats. We also leveled up in terms of our digital storage capacity. We acquired two systems, one for preservation and one for end user access. We worked with a team of 14 core staff members. Um, and there's our full team um, that has been working on this project since 2016. I'll mention that while this was happening, Rob and his colleagues in archives and special collections were still and are still receiving the materials from Universal Music Canada. So semi-truck loads are arriving and have been arriving from Toronto from 2015. And as we're receiving, arranging and describing the archive, we're also preserving it. So it's, it's been pretty wild to say the least. Uh, but our project, our Mellon funded project concludes this month, and I'm proud to introduce some of my colleagues who've worked tirelessly to bring this collection forward. Um, each of them are going, are going to speak to an aspect of the project they contributed to, and then when we're all done, we have time for your questions and comments, and we truly welcome them. Thank you. Thanks, Annie. I'm Rob Gilbert, 
Um, as Annie noted, my work as an archivist, arranging and describing the EMI Music Canada Archive started seven years ago in 2015. There were several complexities involved in the management of the EMI Music Canada Archive and how the archival records have been received and described at the University of Calgary. The EMI Music Canada phone was the first collection of any of the four major record labels to be donated to an archival repository in Canada. Popular music archives are not commonly found in archives, so to find the complete archives of a record label such as EMI in a public archives is rare. Archiving the collection began with research into the administrative history and organizational structure of record labels in general, and more specifically, EMI Music Canada and its predecessor label, Capital Records Canada. The history spans 63 years from 1949 to 2012, The importance of the label in supporting Canadian artists was a defining feature of EMI Canada's vision. The, this likely contributed to EMI's decision to preserve its organizational history as a unique and culturally significant record of the development of Canadian music. In the 1960s, Capital Canada expanded its operations to include domestic productions and began to sign, record, and market Canadian artists with its headquarters in Toronto and a branch office in Montreal. The label was particularly active in promoting Canadian artists at a time when the industry's focus was really on selling American and British acts. Capital EMI took advantage of Canadian content regulations introduced in 1970 to bolster radio play and album sales and thus encourage further development in the domestic record industry in Canada. Over the 1960s and 70s, Capital EMI grew into the largest record label in Canada. The Esquires uh, in this poster from the collection was um, the first pop band that they signed. The archival collection accordingly is among the largest multimedia archives in Canada. The volume of audio and video recordings at 60,000 items, and the range of over 95 different formats is close to what would comprise the entire AV collection of a large provincial archives, uh, such as the Archives of Ontario or the BC Archives. At this stage, the remaining materials to process are largely textual files from the Business Affairs and Financial Administration Departments. So far, we have completed processing the a and records, the President's Office, marketing and promotions, and the thousands of AV assets from demos to studio sessions to mixes and final product. The processing required a solid relationship with the archive's donor, Universal Music Canada. UMC initially provided us with a copy of the EMI Music Master archive system that catalogued and indexed most of the master audio and video recordings. Former EMI, former EMI staff at UMC also provided input and answered our questions about the records and the administrative organization of EMI. UMC rely on the archivist's knowledge of the collection to identify and request items for reissues. Our contacts at UMC have included members of a and Catalog, and Business Affairs. We have had over 20 shipments of records so far from UMC storage at Iron Mountain in Toronto. The materials are received in shipments of four to five pallets of about 150 boxes uh, in each shipment out to the University of Calgary. The collection overall is vast and rich. The archival records provide access into the business operations of a major Canadian record label. Researchers can use the materials to study the development of the music industry in Canada, as well as the work and careers of many well-known and less well-known artists. Music fans and scholars can now study in depth the production process behind an album such as Tea Party's double platinum classic Triptych from start to finish. The researcher is able to access graphic design elements from the, the making of the album artwork, memos, correspondence, and notes in the a and and promotion uh, department artist files, full sets of professional photo shoots for the album and publicity, 300 AV items, including multi-track tapes, open reel mixtapes, stats, and 20 rolls of film. The researcher basically has access to each generation or stage in the production of the, of the album and its promotion. 
And this is the case not just for the Tea Party, but for many key Canadian recording artists. It's truly an incredible resource for exploring and learning about popular music in Canada. And I'll now turn it over to the current EMI Music Canada project archivist, David Jones. Hello. <clears throat> My name's David. I'll tell you a little bit about my role in this project. Firstly, one of the things I did is, you see that little red tab there? That's a right protection tab. I took off hundreds of those every day. So every time I see one, there's a part of my brain synapse that just goes into a weird state. All right, so before coming to the University of Calgary, I'd worked at uh, the University of Toronto Media Commons Archive, and I processed several large audiovisual collections, including two that were quite relevant to this collection. The first was that of the uh, Toronto guitarist Dominic Troiano. Uh, he had released music for Capitol Records in his past. And another was the personal record collection of Paul White. So he was one of the A&R men for Capitol Records of Canada in the 1960s. And he's also known as the man who brought the Beatles to Canada, kind of like Andrew mentioned. All right, so here's just some uh, examples of the kind of AV that comes through. It's really just a random sampling. Uh, on the right, we have lots and lots of demo tapes, which are kind of cool. And in the middle, that's a one-inch reel of um, video. And on the left is a 35 millimeter film. So in 2020, I started my position as project archivist for the EMI Music Canada Fong, the U of C archives, and I worked on video and film assets for the most part from the A&R department. Uh, I also worked on national marketing, promotions, and business affairs, and each of these departments had their own kind of relevant proportion of AV material. The archive as a whole contains examples about, of just about every popular professional consumer and broadcast format you can think of from the second half of the 20th century and beyond. As the archive is a major record label, this includes a diverse array of unpublished materials such as demo tapes, studio tapes, alternate mixes, music video editing materials, and film production elements. This is a cool example from our archive. It's um, from the punk band uh, Teenage Head. They were from uh, Hamilton, Ontario. And uh, in the middle, you'll see the um, uh, enclosure for a quarter-inch uh, demo tape that was recorded around 1978. We don't, actually don't know the uh, specific date. But this recording was used in 2019 to, um, for a repressing um, of their original album with a bonus 7-inch. And on the left, you'll see the 7-inch uh, vinyl, which features some tracks from this original tape. Arrangement and description of audiovisual materials usually done at the item level, and so that means that each tape, disc, or reel is inspected and information is recorded about the item. Uh, tapes that arrive from a specific business department are recorded as such and organized in that context, uh, so we can see the context in which the item was produced. Uh, for example, the marketing and promotion departments are really music uh, video heavy. There's lots and lots of videos in there. Not just videos, um, sorry, not just music videos, but TV spots, electronic press kits, commercials, tape live appearances, um, you know, public appearances and things like that. The A&R department, artists and repertoire, holds the bulk of the recorded music assets, uh, such as master tapes, multi-tracks and studio recordings that were produced as a part of the process of making a specific album. Rob kind of talked a little bit about that. Um, but we also have, of course, unpublished items. And for the directly signed acts, you know, we kind of, um, you know, the AV assets tell the full story, usually from the demo to maybe all of the work they did in between all the different decisions that were made, finally to maybe re-releases or, final, or uh, greatest hits packages. These are some cool examples from the film. Um, there was one and a half million feet of film in total that I processed, um, most of it music videos. On the left, we have some B-boys on eight millimeter uh, stock. These guys are dancing, I think, on Queen Street West. It's for a chaos video. He's a Toronto rapper, um, active in the early 2000s. The one over from that is the world of EMI, and it's kind of cool because there's some computer-generated graphics that are rendered onto the film. And on the right, you'll see a mono-optical track, which is where the soundtrack is. Next to that, we have a clapboard from a band called Billy Satellite. And this is a music video that was shot in Sarnia, Ontario. But the band were American, so I'm not exactly sure why they shot there. But it's cool to see the clapboards. And then the final um, image on the right is a 35 millimeter stock. Uh, and you'll see some musical instruments, uh, Mellotron and Jupiter 8 synthesizer. So before my position as a project archivist, I worked with the migration team as an assistant audiovisual specialist. 
The audio migration project involves migrating audiovisual assets to digital files that can be preserved online as close as possible to their original state, kind of like Annie went over. Uh, so this involves the use of original playback equipment, such as multi-track tape machines, digital audio tape decks, professional-grade video cassette players, optical disc readers of all types. Um, the, the kind of stuff I worked on for uh, optical discs, for example, we made bit, bit transparent transfers by ripping uh, digitally from the optical disc, and then if there was errors, we'd do null checks and sort of correct any samples that were off from that. And all this is to say that you know, bit synchronization and you know, digital synchronicity is really important for those items. Uh, these are some pictures of the Migration Studio. There's actually a lot more stuff in there now, but uh, there's some um, tape machines in the background, DAP machines, and the digital audio workstations connected to them. Uh, there's a full list of equipment on the website. If you are interested in what's there, uh, you can check it out. OK, so the um, final thing is that uh, for analog audio tapes, uh, original documentation is really key. And so that comes along with the assets when they're delivered to us. Things like test tones, tape speed, noise reduction, track configuration, EQ curves, other technical information about the original recording is pretty critical um, to get the um, capacity of the playback machines to match the specifications of the original recording. Uh, the senior, um, senior conservation specialist also inspects all the tapes, uh, does things like um, baking the tapes uh, when needed before transfer. All of the tape machines are configured and examined before each pass and calibrated uh, to make sure that everything is done um, at the highest possible level. So this is an example of a 24-track, two-inch reel, or maybe it's a quarter-inch track, but it's, it's four tracks um, and there's some technical information uh, written on the back of the tape. And this is where we kind of get the most information about what's the tape base, what's the track configuration, how fast is the tape supposed to be played, is there any noise reduction, uh, what kind of EQ curve has been applied, and other information like that. So that's the end of me, and I'm going to pass it on to our in-house imaging expert, Andy Nichols. <laughs> Hello, my name is Andy Nichols, and I'm going to talk briefly about imaging the archive. Maybe I am. There we go. Our goal in making this archive available digitally was to offer high-resolution images of each media object item that was migrated or digitized as a part of this project. The physical media objects contain unique and valuable information that gives a greater context for each recording. We wanted to have final image sets of each individual media item that would convey any and all information stored on them. In addition, we intended the final image sets to be qualitatively robust enough in resolution and color reproduction to meet the needs of researchers. We also scanned any textual materials that were tucked into the box containing each recording. These could include, among other things, lyric sheets, track listings, or prom promotional photos. The images of these materials will be displayed alongside the image sets of the carriers. One early challenge was developing a lighting solution that could function for all formats with minimal post-processing and as little station rearrangement as possible. The first lighting setup involved four studio lights around a plain background, but this produced poor results with the highly reflective EMI materials. A particular note is the DVD in the upper left and the two-inch reel in the lower right. By modifying an off-the-shelf imaging tent for efficient material handling, it was possible to produce decent illumination but still lack the desired color reproduction for all items. Finally, by retrofitting a large fluorescent lighting table with high output, high color reproduction LED strips, we arrived at a desired outcome. It was also important that we design a consistent method to ensure items of a specific format imaged on day one of production would look the same as those imaged on day 600. By utilizing a basic control set of images for surfaces of interest on a given format, it was possible to trace imaging guides in Adobe Illustrator. By centering and combining these separate guides into one unified PNG file, it was then possible to project format-specific guides into the camera live view for all surfaces of interest and maintain absolute consistency across all items of a format group. This method also easily adapt was easily adapted to other formats as visible here. Many objects contain unique information on their physical spines not reproduced on other surfaces. Imaging these spines can be challenging due to the size of the media objects. When we tried using commercial acrylic display stands, they often leaned awkwardly, as shown here in the middle. Ultimately, 
I designed custom acrylic stands to facilitate easier spine imaging. Using the library's makerspace facility and with assistance from my colleague Jeremiah Baker, I was able to laser cut new format specific stands. Since these stands were produced in-house, it was easy to produce any size needed for any format on demand. Historically, when items from cultural heritage collections are imaged, it is difficult to represent scale of the items. Commonly, a ruler would be photographed in frame with the item. However, this placement proved problematic for EMI materials. To remedy this, we developed an experimental method to accurately reproduce item scale digitally. All items are photographed in the raw Nikon electronic format NEF and exported as preservation 8-bit TIFFs. By using the same control set of images from the overlay generation method with a ruler in frame on the item to be scaled, and by measuring the number of pixels per inch from the NEF, it's possible to derive a scale accurate resolution for that format and surface. By using the derived scale resolution as the export resolution for the preservation TIFF of that format, the final image is able to be digitally measured accurately to the item. So in the last photo, there's a ruler running across the tape and it stops at exactly 10.45 and it's a little blurred, but the digital measurement is showing the exact same. In conclusion, these methods, along with art and production scanners, stringent environmental control of the imaging area and color calibrated computer workstations allowed us to image over 12,000 unique media items and produce over 75,000 images in four years, all while ensuring consistency throughout. Thank you. Hi there, uh, I'm Elizabeth Ann Johnson and I'm the Electronic Records Archivist at the University of Calgary. This means that I handle digital material that comes into the archives, whether that's email, textual documents, or Sound Designer 2 files without extensions on them. The terabytes of digital material in the EMI Music Canada phone came to us in many file formats and on many different physical formats. Uh, as David alluded to, we have CDs and CD CDRs, DVDs and DVDRs, DVD RAMs, zip disks, jazz disks, 3.5 and 5.25 inch floppy disks, USB flash drives, USB and FireWire external hard drives, and the odd internal hard drive as well. The files themselves include photographs, raw audio from recording sessions, and Pro Tools and Sound Designer 2 project files that are linked. In order to take care of these born digital materials, we needed to develop a digital preservation system program. Uh, this helped us organize the process of first migrating the files off of the fragile media they came in on, and then to preserve them for future access. Born digital material is a lot more fragile than its analog counterparts. It's a lot easier for something to go wrong and render an entire file unreadable. If a single bit in a digital file changes from zero to one, it can make the entire file unintelligible. If a single letter or even a whole page in a document gets damaged, you can generally still read and make use of it. We want to preserve the original files we get from our donors, as well as the information they contain. To do this, we need to protect our to, uh, uh, to do this, we need to protect our files from technological failure like broken hard drives and bit rot. And we also need to make sure that we're equipped to deal with technological change. We also need robust metadata to ensure that researchers can find the files that they're actually looking for. Before any of this happens, though, we need to get the files off those unstable disks and drives. Because the physical media carriers that the born digital material came in on are fragile and not getting any younger, we need to copy the material from them and onto somewhere safer the backed up servers we have on campus, and eventually a digital preservation system. As the media the material lives on gets older, it gets harder to find the hardware that it works with. Due to the variety of physical formats that the material comes in on, we've had to do some scouring of eBay for drives and cables. We use these drives with a specialized computer called a Forensic Recovery of Evidence device, or a FRED, which you can see here. This computer has a wide variety of ports that we use to connect various storage media. We also use a software system called BitCurator to make bit-for-bit -bit copies of the digital material. And we can also use it to scan the copied files for viruses and to get an overview of the file formats on each piece of media. Using some of our funding from the Mellon Foundation, we were able to acquire a digital preservation system called LibSafe. The system does a lot of the actual digital preservation work I mentioned earlier. 
It makes multiple copies of our material to ensure that it's safe in the event of a natural disaster in one of the, one of the locations where it's stored. We have two remote copies of our material stored in cloud storage across Canada, and one copy stored locally on campus. This campus copy also allows us to have access to the material without needing internet access. The digital preservation system monitors the three copies of our material to make sure that no changes occur to the files. If a change does occur, it's, uh, the DPS is able to restore it to its original form by using one of the other two copies. We want to make sure that this material is accessible indefinitely, and the most accessible file formats change over time. Think about the shift from, from, from WordPerfect to Word files, for example. To allow for this, our DPS is able to automatically generate new copies of our, of our material in accessible file formats we, when we decide it's necessary. The formats of the files we get from our donors are often very specialized, particularly in the case of EMI. In order for our researchers to see and use the material, we need to create access copies and formats that are more easily opened on the average person's computer or phone. The DPS also generates these access copies that then get sent to our access system, Cortex. And you off to Catherine now, who will talk a little bit more about how to access the material in this form. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, I'm Catherine Reddick. Um, I work with digital collections and access to digitized materials. Um, and I'll talk about our access plans. This content is not accessible yet. It's coming soon. Um, and how we're making this content available. So it does feel like sometimes we are cowboys at the University of Calgary treading new ground. The way that we're making this content accessible, you're not seeing in how uh, other archives have made this kind of AV material accessible. But we are really striving for the best access possible that we can provide to our users. Um, working with Universal Music Canada and working with the Canadian Copyright Act, uh, we worked on what can we make accessible to the users as anonymous users, or what can we make accessible to them upon request. Uh, an example of one of the decisions that we made around this was providing clips. So creating clips during that migration process that people have talked about today. Um, with the Canadian Copyright Act, we can make clips available to end users to stream and preview access to content. We can make these images of the media carriers, of the, um, the papers, the, and the formats available to users so they can preview what they're going to see and then request better access. So that's one of the things that we're doing where people can get that access anywhere in the world at any time once we make the collection accessible. Um, Another thing that was really important to us is that we are representing the physical object. So these aren't just bits and bytes of streaming data. They are migrated or digitized from a physical format. Um, and so we really wanted that to be really clear when we made that accessible to end users that this was a physical object. Um, and you can see all of the different paper or physical representations in there. And I'll show you that in a second, how we're displaying that to end users. And then finally, we wanted to empower our users to self-select what they wanted. Um, all of the metadata of all the recordings will be accessible to end users. Users can uh, request what they need, and we'll mediate from there. But we're, they don't have to come to us first to find out what's in the archive. Early on, we recognized that we needed a better system. Um, we wanted a system that had really good audiovisual display and interaction features. Um, things like the ability to create clips, create segments, um, have captioning, um, and represent this object of uh, this physical object and all the images and all the media files that we were creating as part of this process. Um, we can't just make everything accessible to end users, and so it's upon request, and we needed really granular access for an individual or a group of users at a time, um, and it could be for seven days or it could be for a whole semester for a class, for example. So we needed that kind of um, flexibility in making content accessible. And finally, a system that had a shopping cart so people could order what they needed. 
And so we did end up getting a digital asset management system as part of this project and two requests for proposals um, called Cortex by Orange Logic. So this is an example of what one of the objects will look like. Um, at the top, you're seeing that there's a carousel kind of preview area where people can uh, click through and see the clips, preview the clip, preview the images of the object, um, and see thumbnails of any of the media that is restricted access. All of the files are listed below in uh, the package contents. Um, so they'll see all the files and what they are, what they're for. So if it's five files that are part of this package or like 100 files for these multi-track objects, all of that will be listed so people can see what they're getting. Um, on the right, you're seeing some action buttons where people can um, request more access. They can add to their favorites list. They can get a link to uh, go back to that object later on. We're listing all of our metadata, both the descriptive metadata and the technical metadata, and people can use that to browse around as well. And then finally, you'll see some usage information. So users will know what they can do with this object when they find it, or what they need to request more access for. Um, so users can create an account for free. University of Calgary users, um, they can use their University of Calgary account, but anybody in the world can create an account. Um, and they can use that to create favorites lists from this collection. Um, they can use that to follow topics of interest. So if they're super interested in Anne Murray, they can follow and see when we migrate new content in. Um, they can search and browse across the collection, all 47,000 objects in there. Um, and they can request more access with that shopping cart. We'll also have um, like a Ask, a, ask us a question button on any of the objects. So if people have a question as they find things, they can send us a question and we'll respond right within there. So when we do launch the collection, um, the clips will be streamable from anywhere in the world and images will be publicly accessible for download from these media carriers. Um, the full object packages are requestable and People can view and browse and search the data, but if they need more access to our metadata, they can also request that too, so we can send that if people are doing some sort of analysis on the description or even on the media in the, in the files themselves, the data in the files, we can provide API access if someone had some sort of research project where they needed that access. Um, we will provide access under a Canadian copyright library exceptions or under fair dealing. Um, meaning that if people need access for private use or research or instruction, we can provide that access. If they need access for commercial use or exhibition or publication, that's when we route that to Universal Music Canada. And then um, we will be able to provide more access if people do have a larger research request. And so we're calling that our reading room access where um, if people just need to browse themselves, they'll they can come into the reading room or talk to us and we'll give them more access as they need to. So that's our plans. And we're hoping to launch this collection later this fall. Okay. Thanks. <clears throat> we, we have time for questions and comments if you have uh, curiosity about this project. Yes. Uh, So um, regarding copyright, uh, Universal Music is usually the rights holder for this material. So we have certain rights as an educational institution library archive to make them available, but they are the rights holder. Uh, and as for firewalls, <clears throat> I forget the details, but is this level four data? Level three. Okay, we have these data classifications at the university um, that determine how much security is around these servers and things, but Catherine might know more about that. Yeah, so um, all access is being driven through our digital asset management system. And as Annie says, we had really high security restrictions around setting up the system and the levels of access. Um, 
So in terms of like firewalls in particular, uh, those are more based around our integrations with other systems, and we've, we've shut that off to IP restricted kind of access. So only certain IPs can access the content. Um, and then everything else is driven around this user uh, granular permissions. So it's driven at the user account level. If people request content, then they'll have access to content. By default, we're um, just giving streaming access, but maybe people do need download, we'll set that up. And that's all set up at the account level. So it's tracked by an account. Does that help? Um, whatever medium you're storing your stuff on now is going to be obsolete in 10 years or less. Do you have built into your system plans for progressive migration to the latest and greatest, whatever it is? The way five and a quarter inch floppies gave way to three and a halfs and now they're all gone and so forth. Except, yeah. Except in my attic. Right. Of course. I still, I, I still see, lot, see lots of those too, so you're not alone. Um, but yeah, uh, that's part of our built-in like long-term preservation plan is that um, yeah, like just as file formats become obsolete, so does the media itself. So yes, we need to make sure that yes, yeah, it's built into our plans that we will eventually need to migrate to a different storage format. That's also one good thing about working with a, a vendor to create who who runs or like who owns our. Um, who owns the uh, digital preservation system we, that, that we went with because they're kind of on top of that so we don't have to do all of it ourselves, which is nice. Okay, any further questions at all before we move on to the next session? No, okay, great. I, I just wanted to say, wow, really impressive. I mean, what started out as a, an idea to just preserve more of Canada's musical stories, and it's a broad story, I mean, just, you know, Annie, Rob, and Elizabeth Ann, David, Andy, and Catherine, like, just amazing. Um, and um, thank you so much to the University of Calgary. I, I can't speak for Dean's family, but knowing the late Dean Cameron well as a mentor and friend and a great Canadian music champion, he would be so inspired for what you've done with this archive and the artist in particular that so many people worked hard from this country to champion. So. Hats off to all of you. It's really impressive. Thank you. Really, really impressive. <laughs>